Let's turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Nobody's having a stroke after singing too loudly, are they? <laughs> All right, well, don't need to call 911, we're good. Luke, chapter 10, uh, where we're going to be looking at this morning, um, as the uh, title of the message says, Avoiding the Pitfalls of Spiritual Pride. We see that in this um, gospel account of Jesus and the 72 that he sent out to prepare the way for his arrival into these cities. So Luke chapter 10, again we'll read the beginning of verse 17 and read down through verse 24. The Bible says here that the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, the Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then turning to his disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Let's go to the word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for just the opportunity to be able to be in your house as a gathered congregation in obedience to the scripture of not forsaking ourselves and gathering together as there are many that are prone to do. And Lord, being a public image of the corporate body that will be spending eternity in worshiping you, lifting our voices up and making your glory known. And God, we now avail ourselves to the word of God as it is preached to us. It has been designed from the very beginning of time that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we pray, Father, that your will would be done. We pray that you'd be lifted up and that you would draw us unto yourself this morning. For it's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. One of the most obnoxious qualities that we uh, are quick to point out and quick to be disgusted by in somebody else's life is the quality of pride. Uh, all of us have a, a gut-curling reaction when we're around somebody that is just full of themselves. Uh, maybe it's the, uh, the guy at the gym uh, who spends more time looking at himself in the mirror than he does uh, focusing on the weights that he's lifting. Uh, maybe it's the lady who on every mirror she passes has to stop and make sure that her makeup is just perfect and her hair uh, hasn't fallen out of place. Uh, maybe it's the, the, the kid in school who likes to enjoy uh, all of their accomplishments and where their place is uh, in the graduation line. Maybe it's the athlete uh, who enjoys uh, sharing about all their recent accomplishments. Uh, the individual on social media who has to repost every compliment that they're paid by somebody else or making sure that other people see it. The politician who believes that they're above the law. Uh, maybe it's the, uh, the rich person who thinks they're above uh, stooping down to clean up in local city parks. You see, all of us um, are, are naturally good at hating pride in other people. And we would point to uh, the seven sins that God hates in the book of Proverbs and say, well, that's number one. Uh, that God said he hated haughty eyes or a prideful spirit. And we are quick to identify that in other people. But sometimes we fail to realize the pride that seeps into our own lives. And, and as believers, we struggle with the same areas of pride that anyone who has not come to the faith uh, understanding. It takes on different forms um, in that 
there are some people who are prideful by pointing to their accomplishments, and then some people who enjoy denigrating themselves so that someone else will respond with a compliment. Uh, sometimes it's in things that we've done, and then sometimes it's in things that we have not done. And, and as believers, adding on top of that, that there is a danger that all of the followers of Christ face, and, and that is becoming spiritually prideful over the spiritual accomplishments that we experience. Whether that's sin that we've been able to avoid, that someone that we've led to the Lord, the amount of sacrifices that we have made to be able to give sacrificially, whether it's the number of times that we've attended a church service without missing, our faithfulness in, in performing acts of service to God, there's a pitfall that we must be careful of. And that is becoming spiritually prideful over the spiritual victories that we experience. And we've been reading over the past several weeks from Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, where Jesus has sent out the 72 disciples as forerunners, as preparing the way for him, so that when he gets to the city, he can preach that he is the kingdom of God that has come to bear for them, and that kind of the, uh, the, the people will be ready for him to be there. He's told them to preach the good news that the kingdom of God is here, He's told them that they are going to be able to heal people as a uh, uh, outward symbol of what Jesus is going to come to do in their hearts spiritually. And what we've read here, beginning there in verse 17, is what happens when they come back and they are celebrating their success. And one might would think that Jesus would be there with them, ready to throw a party and have a good time and rejoice in what they've done, but that's not exactly what Jesus does. And so as we look at this passage, there's three lessons that you're going to learn. Number one, we're going to see that we don't over-celebrate spiritual victories, but we do celebrate the miracle of salvation, and we celebrate the grace of revelation. So let's look, first of all, at the fact that we are not to over-celebrate spiritual success. As that temptation comes, when success comes our way, again, we've been able to say no to a temptation that has long controlled our lives, and we finally got victory over it. Uh, or maybe the person that we have been trying to win to the Lord, that we've been trying to explain the gospel message of salvation and bring people into the faith, they finally come and experience that, or we've been planning for a, a, a big day at church, and man, we just are super excited over the success we've had. There is a temptation to swell up with pride. And as we look at this passage of Scripture here, that's what we see in the life of these 72 disciples. They come to Jesus, and they're celebrating there in verse 17 over the fact that they were able to cast out demons. So, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The interesting thing is that Jesus never told them when he's sending them out that they were going to be able to cast out demons. He told them that they were going to heal people, but he never let them in on the fact that they were going to be involved in some exorcisms that I'm sure would make things very interesting. But yet that's what they experienced. But instead of celebrating it, Jesus says something to them that we find interesting in verse number 18. He says, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now you can take this in one or two ways. You could either say that Jesus is reminding them that when Satan or Lucifer was cast out of heaven, that Jesus was there. And he saw the disgraceful fall, reminding them of, look, I was there in the beginning when the victory was won. Maybe a foreshadowing of the victory that was going to be won over Satan. Or you could say that Jesus is telling them that, look, when those demons were cast out, that I was party to that event. I saw what was happening. I saw the victories that were won. And then notice what Jesus says after that. In verse 19, he says, Behold, I have given you authority. 
to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. What Jesus does is gives them the reminder that the reason you were able to cast out demons is because I gave you the power to do it. It's an interesting contrast, really, with the 12 disciples in Luke chapter 9. Jesus sent them out with a very similar mission. But in fact, he told them that they were going to be able to cast out demons. But yet, they weren't able to do it. Do you remember the young man that had been possessed by the demon? And the father came to him and said, Jesus, if you would please cast out this demon that is possessing my son. And he said, I, I went to your disciples I heard that they were supposed to be able to perform these great miracles, and it didn't happen. But Jesus was able to do it. And in another gospel, I believe it's in Mark, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, why weren't we able to do this? You told us we were going to be able to cast out demons. We met a roadblock here. What happened? And Jesus' response was, this kind, this kind of miracle only comes through prayer and fasting. So it was a reminder to the 12 disciples that although they had been given the authority to cast out demons, that they still must exercise faith in Christ because Christ is the one that is doing the work through them. And so this is a way of bringing the 72 disciples back down to ground level a little bit Maybe not in a correcting form, but just in a reminder. It's great that you were able to cast out those demons and saw this great spiritual success. But don't forget that the reason you were able to do that was because I gave you the power to do it. Now let's think about how that applies to our lives today. Can I remind you that there is no possible way... For you and I to have victory over sin in our lives, unless by faith we are trusting in the power of God to give us that victory. There is no way that you and I in our own intelligence and wisdom can take the word of God and explain it to someone to where they can trust in Christ as their Savior. Unless the Holy Spirit of God is there empowering us. And working in the heart of that person so that they can trust in Christ. In other words, there is no victory spiritually. There is no good deed that you and I can accomplish that is not completely powered by the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's not trying to hinder their excitement so much as he's trying to remind them, look, don't over-celebrate the success and take credit for it. When you ultimately were not the ones responsible for it in the beginning. It is a reminder to us that our good works don't accomplish righteousness. That that spiritual success that they had experienced then did not mean that spiritual success was going to be guaranteed in the future. That just because they had experienced some victories in the past does not mean that they are going to be free of temptation tomorrow. They needed a constant reminder that our good works do not equal righteousness. The book of Ephesians, chapter number 2, says God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. Why? It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago. Being careful about not over-celebrating spiritual victories. I want you to think about this one. What is it in your life that you are tempted to be prideful over when it comes to the spiritual victories that you've experienced? The good deeds that you've done. The sacrifices that you've made. Maybe as a church family, a reminder to not over-celebrate the victories that we have seen in the amount of money that we have given to missions throughout the years. 
Maybe not over celebrating our faithfulness to preaching the word of God faithfully. Not over celebrating the concern that we have for our neighbors. Keeping in mind that those things are good, but those things are not the ultimate good. And that any spiritual victory is empowered by the grace of God alone. So Jesus looks at his 72 disciples as they return and reminds them, don't over-celebrate spiritual victories. Now he tells them what to celebrate. He tells them to celebrate the miracle of salvation. Celebrate the miracle of salvation. That is what they are to replace their rejoicing with. He's helping them to understand that the only boast they have is Jesus Christ. My favorite song that we sing is that song, All I Have is Christ. It is a great uh, uh, hymn of the faith, although it has been re written in recent years, it is, a, it is a reminder that in my own sinful flesh, man, I was blazing a path straight to hell. And despite my sinful actions, the grace of God overshadowed my life. Drew me into himself, and now all I have is Christ. That is my only boast, is the work of Christ. And my rejoicing should constantly come back to the miracle that is salvation. And this reminder is given to us there as we look at verse, back at verse 19. And, and, and understanding what Jesus is saying here. He said, Behold, I have given you this authority. So he's reminding them that their power, their victory came from him. But I want you to look at what he says in verse 20. He says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. That the spirits are subject to you, the power that you possess. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now I know there's a lot of... Uh, Ideas, a lot of mental pictures we have. We talked about this a little bit in our Sunday school lesson this morning about what that looks like to have your name written down in heaven and who it is that you're going to meet at the gate to be able to look in that book and see is your name there. Uh, I think it's safe to say that there might be a, a little bit of advancements and all you'll just have to Google our names, right, to see if our names are in there. Think Google will be in heaven? Probably not. So I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. There may not be a physical book there. The point is simply that God is saying to us that based off of Christ's work and based off of our faith, that there is a record, there is a confirmation that you and I have trusted in Christ and our sins have been forgiven. And just because I tell you my name is written in heaven, just because I may look like I've lived a life where I'm going to heaven does not necessarily mean that that is accurate. It'd be like you coming today and telling me, Brother Daniel, I'm flying out to California tomorrow. I need you to come pick me up and take me to the airport. So I get there, and it looks like you've got some tickets in your hand. You've got your bags packed, and we're driving to the airport. But that does not mean when I drop you off there that there's going to be a plane there waiting to take you to the airport. You actually have to make the reservations. You have to pay for the ticket, and they have to have a record of those things in order for you to fly. And the same thing is true for us. That just because we know what to say, just because we know how to convince others that that is true, if our names are not recorded in heaven based off of our faith in Christ and his work for us, there's no entry into heaven. And can I tell you the opposite of that is also true? That there is a record of those who have rejected the offer of salvation and the gift of grace. God isn't going to be confused. You're not going to be able to fool God into thinking that you are when you're not. And so the question is here, how did they get their name recorded in this book? How is there a record for these 72 disciples? It's not because they're good works, because Jesus said not to rejoice in that. It then must be simply because of their faith in Jesus. The book of Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So evidently, these 72 disciples 
had placed their faith in Christ Jesus and were trusting him to do for them what he could not do for themselves. And just like they were ultimately not responsible for the power to cast out demons, they were not ultimately responsible for having their names written in the book of life. It was God's work in their lives. And Jesus is reminding them that greater than the miracle of them casting out demons was the miracle that they had their names written in heaven. Greater than the miracle of victory over Satan in that moment was the ultimate victory that was going to be theirs through the work of Christ. I believe the Bible teaches this. John chapter number 14. As Jesus is preparing for the disciples to take over, and lead in ministry, he remarks these words to them in verses 11 through 14. He says, just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask anything in my name, and I will do it. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask anything in my name. And I will do it. One of the greater things Jesus was referring to is simply the participation in. Seeing somebody transformed by the grace of God. To have the new created being in them. As 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us. To see somebody pass from death unto life. That is the greater thing. Can I remind you, it is a greater miracle that I have been resurrected to new life than it was for Jesus to call Lazarus out of the grave and restore to him his physical life. It is a greater miracle that God has allowed us to go to heaven than it was when Jesus turned the water into wine, when Moses was able to cross through the Red Sea, than it was for Jonah to spend three days in the belly of a great fish and come out alive. Than it was for Noah to be able to survive on the ark. It is a greater miracle that I have passed from death unto life. The Apostle Paul would write in Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work. Saying everyone who believes the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This accomplished from start to finish by faith. And as the Spirit says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Jesus says rejoice in the miracle of salvation. I beg it to be true of us that we never get to the place in life where we are not amazed at the grace of God. That we are not completely blown away by the fact that a perfect and holy God would come to this earth take on my sin on the cross of Calvary, to take on my punishment so that in spite of my sins, if I would trust in him, I can take on his righteousness, his perfection, his good works. And when I get to heaven, and however that may look, plead the blood of Christ, and to be able to hear those words that we think we'll hear, well done, that good and faithful servant. Not because I've been a good and faithful servant, but because Jesus Christ was the good and faithful servant. Amen. It is a miracle that we've been saved. Amen. And every time we come to church, man, we should be rejoicing in that. Amen. Every time we sin, we should be rejoicing in salvation. Every time that anything happens, just about any time that we should be rejoicing that we've been saved. So we don't over-celebrate spiritual victories, but we do celebrate the miracle of salvation. The third and final thing that I'll show you this morning is that we celebrate the grace that is revelation. Celebrating the grace that is revelation. I want to draw your attention back to this passage there in verse 21. So this is kind of in a separate instance, but it says that it was following right after that in that same hour. He, referring to Jesus, rejoiced. So don't rejoice, but rejoice. And then Jesus sets an example of rejoicing 
in the grace of Revelation. He says, I thank you, Father, the Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. These things, they're referring to the knowledge that is necessary for a person to trust in Christ. Of knowing that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus has come to this earth to die on the cross as our substitute living and dying for our salvation. That all it takes is our faith of trusting in Christ. These things have been hidden from the wise of the earth. In other words, Jesus is saying that because they are so smart, because they have such understanding, they haven't been able to process what it takes for a person to be saved. You ever met anybody that was too smart for their own good? Anybody want to admit that you might be too smart for your own good? Where sometimes you overthink things that should be so simple. And there are some people that like to process the salvation story and say, there has to be something I can do. There has to be something that I can perform. There has to be something demanded of me. To make my sin right. That I can do to earn this forgiveness. And they struggle all of their lives. And they never come to the faith. Because they cannot just simply by faith trust. That it is the work of Christ. That allows us to be saved. And then he says that you have revealed this to little children. You know the world looks at us as idiots for lack of a better word. That, that we would trust that Jesus Christ really died on the cross. And was really bodily resurrected from the grave that we would believe the things of scripture as it is revealed you know, the bible says that he has taken these things and revealed them to the simple to the little children who will do away with not knowledge but understanding of knowledge and just trust what god has said and then he bookends that by saying such was your gracious will his desire to hide the mysteries of Scripture so that it would take a miracle for you and I to understand it. And that's what he's saying. In verse number 22, he'll go on to say that nobody knows who the Father is except the Son. And nobody knows who the Son is except the Father and then those who the Son chooses to reveal him. What Jesus is telling them is it takes an intentional decision on part of the Godhead for you and I to be able to know who Jesus is. To have an understanding of who God the Father is. The logical question here says, well, Daniel, if that's true, does that mean that those who claim to have no knowledge of Jesus must not be loved by him? Because how can we rectify the fact that the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? But then he's also telling us that the Spirit must personally instruct that individual about who he is for them to come to faith in Christ? And there are people with no written record of the Bible in their own language? There is no preacher to tell them? They have no understanding of what the word of God even means, understanding what happened on the cross? So is he not revealing that to them? He is revealing that. Read the book of Romans chapter 1 later today if you'd like a fuller treatment on this, but it teaches us there about the idea of general revelation. That God has created within all of us, and that's not just those of us that were fortunate to be born in this country, but everyone he ever created was created with a natural desire to know the God of the universe. That there is a higher power out there and to search after that. And the principle in Romans 1 teaches us that when we seek after that, 
that God progressively reveals more to us through his gracious will. But that if we suppress that desire, again, I don't have time to get into all of it. Read it for yourself. We can talk about it later. That when that desire is suppressed in general revelation, that the greater revelation is not able to come. And so I believe that based off of those two things I've told you, that everybody that's ever been created, Jesus has attempted to reveal himself to me. And you and I this morning as believers, if we're standing here by faith, trusting in Christ, I remind you that we are here because of the general revelation. That we are here because of the special revelation. And we are here because God in his glorious grace has shown us these things. Later in the book of Luke, chapter number 24, in teaching this principle to us, you remember that as Jesus was making an appearance to a couple of guys shortly after his resurrection, was teaching them from the scriptures, and the Bible says that they were hearing these things. But then it says in verse 45 that then he, referring to Jesus, opened their minds to understand the scriptures. As I prayed earlier in my prayer that, I, that God would help us see the wondrous mysteries of Scripture. That is asking God to divinely help us to see the truth so that we might be obedient to that. And we rejoice in the grace of revelation. Can I remind you that every day you wake up in this beautiful part of the country... That these glorious mountains and the glorious sunrise speaks to general revelation. That just through observation and God confirming to us, we have what we need to find the work of God. We can also remind you this morning that we in our nation, talking to us today, I don't think anybody here just speaks an exclusively foreign language have the grace of God in specific everything you need to know revelation right here in your Bible did you know that there are over 100 hear what I said over 100 Complete Genesis to Revelation translations of God's Word in the English language. Over 100. Do some research today on how many people don't have one single verse translated into their language. Do you and I have any excuse to not know the God of the Bible? Do you and I have any excuse to not avail ourselves to the deep mysteries of Scripture? This afternoon, you can log on to your computer, you can log on to your cell phone, and you can listen to just about any type of Bible teacher you want to listen to just by typing it in and hitting play. Commentaries galore. Books galore. God has been so gracious to us in making the mysteries of Scripture so plain to our hearts and minds. And we should rejoice that we don't have to wait for a missionary to come in our language, but that we have it all right there for us. Amen. You may say if you're not yet a believer, again, maybe you're watching this online or here in the service, they say, well, God, I just, I haven't gotten there yet. I, I don't see 
the things you see evidently to trust in God? Can I encourage you, would you pray and ask God to reveal it to you? Make that a matter of prayer. And even if you're a believer and you say, well, I'm a believer, but there's some things that are difficult for me to understand. Make it a matter of prayer. Ask God to reveal it to you. And then just open yourself and avail yourself to God's word. Because I believe if we utilize what God has given to us, he's going to give us more to make that complete. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it. Bring your questions. We'll find an answer together. Because I believe God in his grace has revealed to us exactly what we need to know to be fully complete in him. There's an old saying that goes, give credit where credit is due. And we all have experienced the emotional pain to our pride. When we have done something, man, we're sure that people are going to pat us on the back and be excited about what we've done. And then somebody else comes along and takes all the credit for what we've done. And we're screaming inside, no, I did that. But you know, when we give in to spiritual pride, that's exactly what we're doing. We're not giving credit where credit is due. Any good thing that comes from us is a result of God the Father working through us. And if we want to avoid the pitfall of spiritual pride, we won't over-celebrate spiritual victories, but we will celebrate the miracle of salvation and we will celebrate the grace of revelation. And don't say, oh no, this is another sin that I've got to avoid in order to be a good Christian. No, it is simply a reminder that because of the great grace of God, we want to point people to his glory and to place ourselves behind it so that people can see him and not us. This morning, may we give credit where credit is due. Amen. By trusting in him, if you're not a believer, repenting of your sins, taking a hold of the offer of salvation that we've read about, we've talked about, we've sung about, and rejoicing in that, allowing that to be our only boast, all I have is, 